Welcome to Thrive. We're so happy to have you here with us, whether you're in person at one of our campuses, New Britain, Torrington, Terryville, or watching online or on TV. We welcome you. We are so glad to have you. My name is Judah Thomas, and I'm the lead pastor here. And we are in a series called Equipped. And this is all about how the Holy Spirit equips each and every one of us who are following God. He equips us to do a special task. He gives us gifts and talents and abilities so that we can accomplish accomplish his work here on the earth. And so uh, we, it's something that, that if you're following Jesus, you have one. But many of us allow these gifts to go unopened and unused, to sit on the shelf, and, and we never tap into the potential that God has for us. We never tap into to accomplishing the work that God has for us here on this earth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, it says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There's different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. So you may have one gift or ability or talent, and I don't have that. I have something different, but we work together in unity. It says there's different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. And sometimes we get that confused because we think that God needs to act the same way in every person all the time. But here it clearly says that God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. Verse 7, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. If we're following Jesus Christ, then that means that the Holy Spirit is empowering us and is giving us gifts and abilities. He's giving us uh, the, the, the power to accomplish his work here on this earth. But it's important for us to realize how to use them and what they're to be used for. And in your notes, the first thing is that our gifts should be used in love to point people to Jesus. Our gifts should be used in love to point people to Jesus. It, you know, if they're not used in love, your spiritual gifts are worthless. That's right. It's worthless. Did you know that if you're not using it in love, that's what the Bible actually says. The Bible says that if you're not using your gifts out of love, that it's pointless for you to even have them. And this is something that so many people miss. So many people miss this because, because we take our spiritual gifts and we use them for our own benefit, Sometimes we use them to hurt, damage, or wound somebody else. We use them to be critical of others. We use them in a way that, that is not uplifting and not showing love. Now, if there's one chapter in the Bible that tends to uh, encompass what love is, it's 1 Corinthians 13. We call it the love chapter. In fact, if you've ever heard it, it's probably been at a wedding. I've done several weddings lately, and at all the weddings, I read this verse as well because it sounds nice and it says love a lot. But let me tell you something. The love that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13 has actually nothing to do with a romantic kind of love. It has to do with using your spiritual gifts. In fact, you've probably read it before, but have you noticed what it says? It says right here in the very beginning, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. It says, if I could speak in all the languages of earth and of the angels, talking about the spiritual gift here. It says, if I could speak in all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, making a lot of noise but accomplishing nothing. You may have this ability, but if you're not using it in love, it's worthless. Going on in verse two, if I had the gift of prophecy, and the gift of prophecy, this is the ability to speak on behalf of God, to speak into somebody's life. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, imagine having so much faith that you could move a mountain. Imagine that. You're gonna go for a hike one day and there's a mountain. You say, you know what? I don't wanna go up the mountain. Could you just move out of the way a little bit? And it just moves and you just go on right by it. Imagine having that kind of faith. You'd say, that person is walking pretty close to God. But here it says, if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. Nothing. Worthless. It says, if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my own body, as a martyr saying, I'm going to give my life, you know, as a ransom for somebody else. I'm going to sacrifice my own body. But if I could boast about it here. But it says, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. 
See, this is talking about the spiritual gifts. See, we read 1 Corinthians 12, we read 1 Corinthians 14, and both of those have to do with spiritual gifts and how they're to be used in the church, but we often fail to realize that 13, sandwiched here in the middle, is all about how to use our gifts in love. In fact, in your notes, our gifts are worthless if we use them without love. Are we using our gifts without love? Are we using our gifts in a way that's divisive and that cuts other people down? Are we using our gifts in a way that, that, that is bringing shame to God and shame to the, to the church and the good news? See, we need to focus on serving people with our gifts, but it's filtered through love. Would love do that? We should never use our gifts in a way that is unloving. And if we are using them in a way that's unloving, then this verse applies where it says that we are nothing. Almost every time in the Bible, when it talks about spiritual gifts, it also talks about love right nearby. Because, because it, there, there's a tendency for us to use our gifts in an unloving way. To use our gifts in a way that is self-serving rather than God-serving. Maybe you've been given some gifts and abilities the gift of serving, gift of generosity, maybe a, a, a gift or ability musically or, or administratively or creatively or something like that, and we're using it for our own glory rather than God's. We're using it in self-serving ways. This is the verse that we're kind of hinging everything on here. It's Ephesians 4, verse 11. It says, Now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. The apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. The apostles, those are the, are the dreamers, the visionaries. The prophets, these are the ones who speak on behalf of God to other people. The evangelists, these are people who share their faith with others, who love to invite people, bring them into the church and into the kingdom. The pastors, those are the ones who come along beside you when you're going through difficulties, who offer wise and godly counsel. The teachers, these are the ones who are able to teach God's word in a way that's relevant and applicable to life. These are the gifts that God has given to the church. These are the gifts that God has given to us. And these gifts are represented here in your life. One or maybe multiple of these are represented in your life. And you've maybe never thought of it this way before, but this is what God has given to the church. Not for your own benefit, but for the benefit of the kingdom of God. Verse 12, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. These are all different gifts but yet they serve the same purpose. They serve the church and they point people to Jesus. So we're gonna start with the, with the first one on this list. Apostle. Ironically, it's the strangest word out of all five of them. The apostle, right? And, and so, so we're gonna start with that. And, and it's kind of, it's also the most controversial in many ways because, because there's a variety of people out here that say that this gift no longer exists in the church. There's people that say, like, this one is gone. You got the other four, and that's great, deal with it, but, but this one's gone. Then you got people on the other side who just use it as a title. They're like, just call me Apostle Judah, right? I mean, like, if I ever ask you to do that, just slap me, okay? Because, that, like, we're not going there. Um, but people use this as a title, right? Most holy apostle, you know, whatever your name is, you know, Judah, PhD or something. You know, it's like, it's like, why do we want these as titles? Well, this is, it's kind of a funny sounding one, but we're gonna dig into this. See, uh, apostle is a very important role in the church. Essentially what an apostle is in your notes, apostles are pioneers who are sent out to spread the message of Jesus. Now it's different from an evangelist, but, but they're, they're pioneers. They're ones who are going basically into uncharted territories. They're, they're adventurers, they're risk takers. They're ones who, who start churches. They're, it's a significant role in the body of Christ. If you think about Jesus, right? We, we, we talk about the, the, the 12 disciples or the 12 apostles, and we often use those words kind of interchangeably. Well, the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples. But, but let's be very clear. Jesus had many disciples, we know at the very minimum he had 70, most likely even much more than that. He had a lot of disciples, but he only had 12 apostles. And they were sent out with a purpose. And we see this mentioned in Luke chapter 6, verse 13. It says, at daybreak, he, and the he is talking about Jesus, at daybreak, Jesus called together all of his disciples, and he chose 12 of them to be apostles. 
So, so there's a significant difference there. He's like, gathers all of his disciples and says, you, 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 you 12, you're gonna be my apostles. Now, I kind of feel bad for the other guys sitting there like, well, what about me, right? But for some reason, Jesus chose these 12 for a specific reason, chose them to be the apostles. Now, these words are different. The word disciple means a learner, a pupil, a student, or perhaps a disciplined one. These are the followers of Jesus. They're the students of Jesus. They're learning the ways of Jesus and trying to apply their, into their lives and trying to, to make a difference in their life by following the pattern that Jesus had. And that's what it says. He calls his disciples. But apostle means one who is sent. One who is sent. So he's got these disciples. He says, but out of you, you 12, I'm sending you, sending you as a messenger, sending you as a delegate or an ambassador. This is a mission, and not only a mission, but they have the authority to carry out that mission. It's like responsibility with authority. You know, if you have responsibility but no authority, it becomes very frustrating, doesn't it? If you have responsibility to get something done, to make these big decisions, to, to, to carry out all these things, but you don't actually have the power, say, to spend money to make it happen, it's frustrating. Or on the flip side, if you've got the, the, if you've got the, 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 the power to do it, but you don't have the responsibility, that's frustrating as well. Here, God is giving them the mission, but with the authority. These are the visionaries, the dreamers, but also the planners and the pioneers, the ones who go and they uh, do great things for the kingdom of God. They go into uncharted territories. Now this gifting is something that, that I believe God has given to the church and he's given it to many people. Sometimes we just look at like, like, like one person, like, oh, well, this is the, the apostle. No, God gives it to us in varying degrees. This is a gift that, that I, I resonate with a lot because you know, God has called me to, 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 to do a lot of different things and to, to pastor churches and to, to launch campuses and things like this. And, and when somebody has a, a gift of being an apostle, they love to, to lead other people. They love to organize systems and develop plans and, and they make strategies for, for accomplishing God's work in this world. They build new ventures and they see things before other people see them. What do I mean by that? That's what a dreamer is. That's what a visionary is. Anything that we see in this world was seen before it was actually there. Somebody had the vision. Somebody had a vision for this to be built, for that structure to happen, for, for this building, for this organization. They had the dream, and then they rallied people behind the dream and led them to see the fulfillment of it. You have to see it first. So the apostles, they helped to build foundations. They helped to, to create a culture a culture that is hopefully warm and loving, a culture that, that loves to see people who are far from God you know, transform their life and experience God's grace. They embrace leadership opportunities, and ultimately, all of these gifts, but specifically this one, works to build unity with other believers, works to bring unity, that we are unified together, working together with one vision, one mind, and one purpose to accomplish the work that God has given to us. So the main skills are usually the ability to lead and organize and develop other leaders, to raise leaders up, to build things, to expand things, to strengthen churches, to launch churches, to, to facilitate ministries. It's very much so a, a leadership role, a visionary role. Now, this doesn't mean that all of them start churches or become missionaries because some who have the gift of, of being an apostle, some start small groups. And some lead ministries, and some of them throw block parties in their neighborhood so they can meet their neighbors. This is something that there's five gifts, so this means that on average, probably one out of every five of us has this gift in some varying degree. It may not be uh, the exact same. It may not look the same in, in your life as it looks in someone else's life, but that's okay. It's the same purpose, the same function and the church. See, what we tend to do is we tend to look at the most prominent examples of the gifts and then we disqualify ourselves. Like, well, if that's what it means to be an apostle or a prophet or a pastor and I'm not like that, 
then I must not really have it. And we look at these, these uh, you know, great examples and we read stories of, of the great apostles, even, even the 12 apostles in the Bible. We read about, about the apostle Paul. We read about you know, evangelists, Billy Graham, and people like that. And, and we're like, wow, you know, I, if, if, if being a, uh, an evangelist is to be like Billy Graham, well, I'm certainly not that. And then we disqualify ourselves. We see other people that are doing things at a scale that we could not even imagine. We can't fathom that. And so we disqualify ourselves. But we have to realize that these are different people in different situations that have different goals, they're on a different mission from God, and they're at a different stage of their journey. But yet some of us, we disqualify ourselves before we even lift a finger, and then we allow that to reinforce the thought that we don't actually have to do anything. And we allow our gift to sit on the shelf going unused and unopened and say, well, you know what? If I can't be like them, I'm not gonna use it at all. Just because I'm not as good as that person, I could never do what they've done, then I must not have it at all. And we sell ourselves short and we allow a gift, a precious gift that the Holy Spirit has given us to go unwrapped. In your notes, no one can impact the people that God has placed in your life better than you can. See, there's people that God has put in your life, that he's put on your heart, that he's equipped you to, to reach out to these people. There's people in your family, there's people in your school, there's people at your work that God has called you. There's people in your neighborhood that God has called you to make a difference in their life. And, and now we may look and we may see some famous Christian leader on TV or online and we're like, wow, I'll never be like them. But they will also never reach the people that you can reach. They, they will never impact your circle as well as you can impact your circle. See, God has put you where he's put you for a reason. He's equipped you with the gifts that he's given you for a reason, for a function. So, an apostle, these are people who help to prepare the way for others. These are people who help to, to lead others. They're always pushing into new territory. And you know, it's apostles are not satisfied with what has happened in the past. Not satisfied with what's happened in the past. As a result, as somebody who, who has this gift in a certain degree, it's also hard to celebrate your successes of the past because as soon as you reach a milestone, you're already looking on to what's next. And it's like, okay, I'm just looking on, what, what's next, what's next, what's next, what's out there next? And, and so it's, it's, it's like whatever is in the past, well, that's great, that's good, but we're moving forward. But an apostle, whether large or small, whether over a lot of people or a few people, have the ability to motivate people towards a common vision, towards a common goal. As John Maxwell said, a leader who is leading and nobody is following is only taking a walk. If you think that you're going somewhere but nobody's following you, you're not really leading. But when uh, you step up and you lead and you rally people together and they're like, you know what, we want to go where you're going. This is a leadership gift. This is a gift that serves the church. And man, we need it and we need more of it. True pioneers of the spirit are never satisfied. Never satisfied with the status quo. Never satisfied with what happened before. They're always looking forward for new ways and new avenues to build the kingdom, to reach the hurting, to feed the hungry, to help the hopeless. They defy all limitations that are put on them. And they dance to the beat of a different drummer. Obstacles come when well, you just climb over them in faith and keep on moving forward. They don't allow anything to stop them from doing the will of God. Paul was a great example of an apostle. Paul was traveling throughout the known world at the time and he was traveling there and he was preaching the gospel and he was starting churches and he made guidelines for how the churches should operate and he was raising up new leaders and then he was mentoring leaders and he was developing other people. Jesus also demonstrate this. We see that he was sent in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. God sent his son, Jesus, and Jesus was sent and he developed others and he raised up the apostles and he started a movement which was then carried on by his followers. The apostles, they love to dream, dream big dreams. They love doing new and challenging tasks. They love change, especially when the change is their idea. You ever notice that about the change? Like, like, like nobody likes change unless if it's your idea, right? If it's your idea, like, hey, we got to do this. Everybody's like, no, we don't want to, we don't want to do that. But somebody said, no, we got to change. We love change when it's our idea. But, but, but a true leader has the ability not only to see the change, but to inspire others to want that as well. So uh, um, 
many people also can demonstrate this gift of, of being an apostle in, in other ways as well, not just in the church, but, but in building businesses and developing leaders and making a difference in the world, starting nonprofits or getting involved, leading community uh, or civic groups or things like that. But ultimately, when we're operating in this gift that God has given us, our goal and our heart is always undercover that we're wanting to point people to Jesus. Whether it's in school or at work, whether it's in our neighborhood or our family, we're always wanting to point people to Jesus. Now, Throughout the series, we're going to do this thing. It's, it's kind of fun that we're going to look at, a, we're going to look at a, the, the different gift, but we're also going to look at some of the negatives of the gift. Because sometimes with the gift, there's negatives. Remember, we started this out by saying whenever we use the gift, we need to use it with love because there's the potential to use it without love. There's the potential to, to misuse or abuse the gift that God has given you. So here's a couple of the potential negatives that may go along with this gift. Uh, people, you know, apostles, people who have this gift that are immature have a hard time distinguishing between good ideas and God ideas. Is this idea good or is this idea from God? They get a lot of ideas, but they need the maturity to be able to discern what is from God and what's just a random idea that pops into their mind. I mean, like, I, I get so many ideas in my mind. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be the greatest thing in the world. And, and I have people that kind of reel me in. like, okay, hold on, hold on. Like, let's think through this a little bit before we just go off on this direction. See, because this is a potential downside when you have this gift. Another thing is that, that you kind of try something new every week, right? Like, if that's you, if you're always just going from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, never fully developing your ideas, just jumping from one thing to another. All throughout uh, my years growing up, I started so many different businesses. I had a, I had a t-shirt business. I, I made a movie. I had a graphic design business. I did web development, did, uh, you know, internet marketing, did all kinds of things throughout the years. It's just kind of like jumping from one thing to another to another, always looking at the next thing, and often not being satisfied with where you are and not always pulling the things that you've you know, had this dream about, not actually bringing them to full development because it's focused on what's next and not what's there currently. After a while, as a result of this, after a while, people can stop following you because we have a hard time staying focused on the task at hand. It's always the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And people are like, I wanna follow you, but I don't know where you're going. It's like you're just all over the place. Like, like if you could just hone it in on one or two things, then we can follow you. See, people aren't gonna give you time and energy when it could just change at any whim. Another one of the downsides or potential downsides, potential traps of this is that they can tend to sacrifice people on the altar of the mission. Sacrifice people. It's like, well, it's all for the mission. It's all about the mission. It's not about the people. As long as we're accomplishing the mission, people become a, a means to an end. It's like, okay, we, we gotta get this. We gotta make this happen. And you know what? If you're with me, you're with me. But if you're not, you're not. And if you're not with me, then just get out of my way because we're going forward anyway. And, and, and you can lose the people side of things. In fact, we see this very evident in the life of the Apostle Paul, right? I mean, Paul, he's the guy that wrote you know, a big chunk of the New Testament, and yet we see this very thing happening to him. And he's throwing one of his colleagues under the bus in Acts 15, verse 36. It says, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, Barnabas was also another apostle. They were working together, spreading the gospel. He said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. So, so you see Paul and Barnabas, they went, they started all these churches. They're, they're, they're filling this role of apostle. Now they're kind of changing gears, saying let's cycle back through and make sure they're doing okay so we can offer some coaching and some mentoring. This is a great thing. This is what an apostle loves to do. Verse 37, Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark, but Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. So Paul's like, you know what? You, you, you did me wrong, you are not, I'm not taking another risk on you. Verse 39, their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and he sailed for Cyprus. You know, Mark made one little mistake, and, or maybe it was a big mistake, I don't know, it seems like it was maybe pretty significant, but Paul just decides, oh, I'm just gonna write you off, that's it, I'm done, you're dead to me, just get lost, I don't wanna have anything to do with you. Now Barnabas, who also had the gift of being an apostle, but he also had the gift of being a pastor, and he also had the ability to, to empathize with this guy. He gave him another chance and said, no, you know what? I'm not gonna write you off. I'm gonna bring you with me, and I'm, we're gonna accomplish the work 
that God has for us. So if you feel that this is a gift that maybe is, is in your life, now, maybe, maybe, maybe you don't feel like this is a gift in your life. You're like, well, you know, this isn't my gift. That's okay. The, the reason why this is good for us to hear these different things is because even if it's not a gift that applies directly into your life, it may be a gift that you can help to call out in other people's lives. Like, you can see that in somebody else, and you can say, hey, you know what? I noticed this in you. I noticed that, that you have some leadership uh, abilities. I noticed that, that whenever we're getting together and we're going to play a game with a group of people, you're the one who always stands up and tells everybody the rules. Like, you have that ability to lead other people. Like, you like to, to take the reins in these situations, and we can help to call these out in other people. But if you feel that, that this may be your gift, here, here's a couple things that we need to keep in mind. The first thing is, is in your notes that we need to look for God ideas and not just the good ideas. Look for the God ideas. What is it that God is calling us to do? What is it that God is inspiring us to do? What is it that, that, that God is, is leading us? Not just a good idea. Like we can have good ideas all the time, but just because you have a good idea doesn't mean it's from God. And here's the, the honest truth of the matter is sometimes the good ideas will actually overshadow the God ideas. We'll get so many good ideas going that we forget about the God idea the idea that God actually has for us, the thing that he actually wants us to accomplish here on this earth. So we need to seek God for wisdom and discern the ideas that maybe you get and seek, seek advice from people that have discernment. Maybe you have this prophetic gift. Say, hey, you know what? I got this idea. What do you think about that? I mean, I, I did this early on when, when, when I was making some major changes in my life. I had this idea. I'm like, I'm going to go out and, and I'm going to start a coffee roasting company and I'm going to import you know, coffee beans from another country and we're going to roast and we're going to do all this stuff. And I told one of my close friends, I said, I'm going to do this. This is going to be the greatest thing. He's like, you're nuts. Like, what are you thinking? He's like, you can't do that. I'm like, yeah, I can. And he totally talked me out of it. But, but, but it was a good thing because, because I was going to go down a different path altogether. And I needed somebody to kind of like rein me and say, well, that, that may be a good idea, but is it really a God idea? Another thing is that we don't base the value of people on their ability to contribute to our vision. That maybe God has called you to do something. Maybe God is calling you to lead something. And we're like, man, I'm just so passionate about getting this thing done. I'm just so passionate about seeing God work in the situation and I need people to help. But you know what? If they're helping me, then they're for me. And if they're not helping me, then I don't wanna have anything to do with them. We need to not base people's value on their ability to contribute to our vision. We also need to be patient and give people time to buy into the vision that God has given us. You may have a hard time doing this in love because sometimes we just wanna steamroll people. Well, here's where we're going. It's either my way or the highway. We need to stay focused on the mission at hand and don't get sidetracked. Don't take all the little rabbit trails everywhere else. Don't, don't, don't end up chasing all the good ideas and miss out on the God ideas. We need to find the direction that God has set for us and then stick to it at all costs. See, when you know the direction that God has for you, you pursue it at all costs. So if you have this gift, dream big dreams, conquer new territories, reach new people. And whatever gift it is that you may have, whether it's this one or a different one, I would encourage you to fan it. As the Apostle Paul says, fan it into the flames, kindle the fire, develop it, cultivate it, use it. Don't let your gift go on use use it for the kingdom of God but use it in love to accomplish his work for us here on this earth let's pray father we come to you now and we thank you for your goodness we thank you for your mercy we thank you for all of your many blessings we thank you that you've given us gifts and you've given us abilities you've given us talents you've given us past experiences and you want us to use it for your glory so help us to do that Lord if you're here today and you don't know Jesus is your Lord, don't let another day go by. Like he wants to be a part of your life. He's got a gift for you. He's got eternal life. He's got forgiveness and grace and mercy. It says in Romans that if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and you say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you'll be saved. And if that's where you are today, if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, won't you say that with your mouth? Say, Jesus, you are my Lord. God, we thank you that you've equipped the church and our church with many great gifts. And you've equipped each and every one of us with a gift, with an assignment. 
Let us work together, work together in unity to accomplish the work that you have here for us. Please raise up more apostles and prophets and teachers and, and pastors and evangelists. Raise them up, Lord. Raise us up. Equip us to do the work that you have for us so that we can reach more people, so that we can see more people in your house and at your table serving you. We thank you for your many blessings to us. We thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you that you've gifted us and empowered us. We thank you that you haven't left us or forsaken us, but you are taking the journey here with us. So we thank you for all of these things. We praise you and we worship you and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.